morning, church. It's good to be back today. Let's stand. Let's lift our voices to the Father this morning. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see. I want to see. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see I want to see To see you high and lifted up Shining in the light of your glory Pour out your power and love chapter 6 verse 33 seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and he will give you everything you need father we are honored to be able to gather here today I think of of the words of the song we just sang and I can't help but think of David's words um, show me my heart God um, show me my anxious anything anxious thoughts within me know those anxious thoughts and lead me on the path Lord, show me anything in, the, in, in me that offends you and lead us on the path of righteousness. Help us to see your glory and your, your majesty and your sovereignty in our lives that we may rejoice in you always. And Lord, that our dependence on you as Father would bring about a calmness in our lives that we know that you have things in your control. Lord, we're gathered here today as a people who want to worship you, who want to give you praise. Lord, we're so privileged to be able to meet around the table again today as a family to participate in this uh, memorial that reminds us, regardless of what we face here in this place, 
And Lord, we have a God who is victorious. And so we praise you today. We thank you that we can come to you confessing and praising, Lord, that we can draw strength from you. Lord, we believe in everything that you are and all the promises that you've given us. And we pray these things in Jesus' holy name. And all God's people said,
Amen. You can have a seat this morning. It's good to be back today. I am not going to, um, not going to lie, it was really good to be um, in Florida with family um, and be in the sunshine on a week where I hear you guys had lots of gray and lots of rain. So um, what a beautiful week it's been and how, how gorgeous has it been the last two days just to see that sunshine outside. So it's so good to be back. I appreciate the worship team um, leading, appreciate Jeff um, sharing from the word last week. It's always good to know things are in good hands. This morning, <clears throat> excuse me, I want to encourage you to open your Bibles to the Old Testament prophet of Haggai. And I'm going to give you some time because it's, it's a hard Old Testament book to locate. It's a very short book, um, just two chapters hidden in the midst of a bunch of Old Testament prophets. But as this current sermon series goes, little books might be small books, but they have a big impact and they have an immense meaning in our lives. They're still the inspired words of our God and Creator. And so there's so much to learn there. So Haggai chapter 1, um, find that. Don't be afraid. Um, for those of you using your phones, you're cheating, okay? But don't be afraid to use, you know, to, to, to find the page and all those good things. But as you're getting there, I really want to set some context this morning because it's really important for us as we open up God's Word and as we read it to understand um, what's happening and, and what's taking place. And so Haggai wrote God's inspired words to the people of Israel in a time when many had come home from being exiled. See, in 587 BC, the Babylonian Empire had destroyed Jerusalem. They had killed many. They had carried off the brightest and the best and taken them into captivity. They left the poor. They left the injured. They left the diseased behind to fend for themselves most uh, to, to die and all those horrible things. And it was a low point in Israel's history. And for years, the prophets had warned God's people. They warned Israel. They warned Judah. We've abandoned God. We've taken him off the throne, um, out of the center of our lives. We've placed him over to the side, and, and he wants to be at the center of our lives. Like, we've abandoned him. If we don't turn back, he's going to lift his hand of protection and allow us to experience our own destruction. You know, God's desire is, is the, the prophets would tell Israel, God's desire is to be at the center of our lives. He desires to be our God and our, our, our leader. But the people wouldn't listen. And, and, and like I said, they were utterly destroyed and were carried off into captivity to serve Babylonian kings, many of them. And the beautiful temple that Solomon had constructed was left absolutely in ruins and rubble. And anything of value was plundered. So you fast forward now from that point. Fast forward 70 years, okay, seven decades, and the Babylonian Empire has collapsed, and the Persian Empire was in control. And they would allow nations to go back and rebuild. For them, it was one of these things where, sure, you go back and you rebuild, make our empire look beautiful, but you're still under our thumb, you still follow our instructions, and you still know that we're in control. And so they would allow any Israelite who wanted to to return home and to rebuild. Some wanted to stay. They had built a, over, I think, you know, think about it, over 70 years, some people had built a life for themselves. In fact, God told them, he instructed them, you know, plant gardens, do these things, live life, because you're going to be here for a while. And so some wanted to stay, others wanted to go home. And I, this is just my speculation, this is just my opinion, but I would imagine those who wanted to return home either were the older ones who had seen Jerusalem in all of its glory and beauty or those who were connected to those types of people. So others wanted to go home, and they returned to what was left of their city and homes, which wasn't much. And the first group who went home and returned um, under the leadership, they returned under the leadership of a priest named Jeshua and a political leader named Zerubbabel. And so that's the context. People were going back home. And, and as we think about this and as we prepare to engage the word this morning, I want to ask a few questions of us and have us to, to ruminate on those things and to think about those things as we read God's word. The question is, what does your life center around? What is the greatest priority, or what are your greatest priorities? What are the things that you fix your thoughts on? What is most important to you? Because these are important questions. And our answers to these questions will steer and direct our hearts and our lives. And, and our answers don't just affect us. 
but also the people who live life around us with whom we share our lives. And as much as I'd like to think that my demeanor and my decisions really affect only me, the older that I get and the more responsibility that I assume, the more the ripple effects of my demeanor and my decisions affect the people around me, affect my wife, affect my kids, affect my church. And so as much as we think that there are many answers to these questions, there really are only two answers. What's most important? Is it me or is it my creator? And I know that some of you would maybe scoff at that and think that's overly simplistic and overly churchy, but it's true. The answer is I either serve myself, my life is all about self-preservation, or I serve God. I rest in and trust in the abundance and provision and love of my creator, my father. And I want to unwrap that this morning, but also I want us to understand as we're walking through this, and this is absolutely vital, we need to understand that in these weak mortal bodies that we dwell in, that we will battle between being me-centric versus keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus. All of us in the room will. We all have. We will battle for control versus relinquishing our cares to Jesus. We'll battle with self-preservation and trusting in his love and provision, period. And so it's why we come back every day confessing the struggle and the battle. It's why we come back daily thanking him for his grace and his mercy. It's why we come back every day saying, God, I give you thanks. Your mercy is new every morning. And so we have a whole lot of things to learn um, from Haggai. And so we're going to look at those lessons this morning. Lesson number one, be careful with misplaced priorities. And again, I want to just continue to set just a little bit more context, and then we're going to look at chapter one. So the first group of Israelites arrive home, and I can't even begin to imagine. I just want you to think of it, try to picture it if you can. They arrive at Jerusalem, and it's sat in ruins for seven decades, okay? Crumbled homes, wild animals living there. Honestly, if you think about what the Word of God says, dead bodies, the remains, bones, um, the center of the city, the glory of Solomon's temple that he had built rubble. Anything of value had been plundered and carried off. So that's what they came home to, a wasteland. And that had to be incredibly difficult for the older returnees, the exiles who came home, who knew and had seen Jerusalem when she was in all of her glory. Um, This wouldn't be the first or the last time that this city would go through this in history. I can't help but think of last week, we went down... um, We were in the Fort Myers, Naples area, and we went to visit Brandon and Ashley Skinner on Sanibel Island in Florida. Have you guys ever heard of noceums before? Has anyone ever heard of this? That is awful. We have been itching our leg. It didn't happen until two days after we had visited, and I'm like, do we have fleas in the Kia? Like, something's going on. So we've been, if you see my kids or my wife doing this, it's because of the noceums on Sanibel Island. But anyway, if you don't know what those are, they're microscopic bugs that bite you and then it itches. Noceums, you can't see them. They're, na- they're, you know, anyway, you can't see them. So as they took us around the island, Brandon kept trying to explain how things looked compared to how they look now. And it, everything is slowly coming back. But you think about Hurricane Ian had decimated that area. And there was almost a grief in his voice. He's like, well, this area used to be like this. It once looked like this. Fort Myers was the same. As we drove through, we took the long route. We wanted to kind of see some different things. And if you look, if you drive through Fort Myers, homes are still untouched after that hurricane. Many people have boarded them up. They're not coming back. Hotels completely gone, piles of rubble, literally. Um, The entire place very much still under construction after a year and a half. And there are many people who have left never to return to that area. And again, Hurricane Ian was in the fall of 2022, and so we're a year and a half out. And I just want you to think, as we drove through there, it's just, it was just really interesting. There's so many things that are still rubble, and it's a very similar scene that we're reading this morning. The people had been back, though, for several months in Jerusalem. They're starting to rebuild. Haggai chapter 1, beginning with verse 2, this is what the Lord of Heaven's armies says. The people are saying the time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. And then the Lord sent his message through the prophet Haggai. Why are you living in luxurious homes while my house lies in ruins? This is what the Lord of heaven's army says. 
look at what's happening to you. You've planted much, but you harvest little. You eat, but you're not satisfied. You drink, but you're still thirsty. You put on clothes, but you cannot keep warm. Your wages disappear as though you were putting them in pockets filled with holes. This is what the Lord of Heaven's army says. And, and I think it's so interesting that that's the words that God gives to Haggai. He's reminding the people that I am sovereign, I'm sufficient, I am the Lord of Heaven's armies. Put your trust in me, and, and I don't want to get too far ahead of myself here. But then he says, he says, look what's happening to you now. Go up into the hills, bring down timber, and rebuild my house. And then I'll take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. You hoped for rich harvests, but you were poor. And when you brought your harvest home, I blew it away. Why? Because my house lies in ruins, says the Lord of Heaven's armies. While all of your busy building, your, your fine houses, looking after your own life, all of these things. It's because of, of you that the heavens withhold dew and the earth produces no crops. I have called for a drought on your fields and hills, a drought to wither the grain and grapes and olive trees and all of your other crops, a drought to starve you and your livestock and to ruin everything you've worked so hard to get. Boy, does that sound really mean. But it's a God who is pruning and disciplining his people in love. So the building project had begun, but what we see is that the Israelites' first priority was me. Now, I think a little bit of empathy is needed as we read this text. It makes sense to me, upon arrival, that I need to construct a place to live, I need shelter and basic necessities for myself and my family, but the text tells me they were living in fine homes, even luxurious homes, all the while the temple, God's home, still laid in ruins. And I think we can so relate with that church. You see, the next point here is that they never had enough. God says, you're, you're planting, but you're not harvesting a lot. You, you, you eat, but you're not satisfied. You drink, you're still thirsty, you put clothes on, you can't keep warm. Your wages seem to disappear like you're putting them in pockets filled with holes. And my question for us is, how often do we sit in a place of scarcity instead of focusing on a God who gives abundantly? How often are we content and satisfied? Church, we live in a world that believes that contentment comes from obtaining an object that we've longed for or by accomplishing the things that we want to accomplish. It tells us that having the best life <coughs> includes the house and the job and the car and the career and the other materialistic things that we desire. And I'm not saying any of those things are bad. But when they take precedence and they sit on the throne of our lives rather than God, well, we'll talk about what happens in that. The thing is, church, salvation doesn't eliminate our battle with these desires. And so our, our flesh, these earthen vessels that we live in, you know, we're going to be prone to seeking fulfillment and happiness in the world. All of us in here have done it. There's a constant search for that place, that thing, or that person, even that person who will meet all of my needs and bring me joy. We've got self-help books on finding contentment because everyone is searching for joy. And the problem is we often search for it in this world. And the reality that God is showing, even to the Israelites in this moment, that, that they will only find peace when he is at the center of their lives, the reality is we were created, church, to find fulfillment in Jesus Christ. Another lie that the world tells us is that we, if we have our health, we have everything. That we can't find contentment if we don't have good health. Does that mean a person battling terminal illness? person battling physical or mental illness can't enjoy their purpose in life and have contentment. I think of the Apostle Paul. He had asked and pleaded with God, actually, to remove this thorn from his flesh. And so much debate about what was the thorn. Was it a sin that he dealt with? Was it a physical infirmity? We don't know. But he pleaded with God, and what was God's answer to him? My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in your weakness. We can be content, church, even in our weaknesses. That's a hard lesson for me to accept and learn. But as John MacArthur, put, MacArthur puts it in his study, the weaker the human instrument, the more clearly God's grace shines forth. So again, what does it take for us to experience contentment this side of heaven? I wonder if any of you in the room are struggling with finding contentment. Paul says in Philippians chapter 4, verse 4, to rejoice. You guys probably, many of you may have memorized this text. 
Rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again, just in case you didn't hear me. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do you know what the Greek word for gentleness means and why Paul talks about that there? It means calm, steady, mild, not easily irritated, moderate, reasonable, before ever getting to your anxious thoughts before God, because you know that's the next line. Any anxieties that you have, bring it to God and with prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, and God will meet you. He will meet you where you're at. He's going to take care of you. But the first thing that Paul says before he says anything about that is rejoice in the Lord, meaning trust in his abundance. He will take care of you regardless of what you're facing. Trust in his provision. Trust in his sovereignty. Because when we trust, it brings a gentleness and a calm and a peace about us because we trust that the Lord is near and he has all these things in his hand. Then we bring all of our anxieties before him. Church, this is, this is my battle. I will tell you, I have to come daily before God confessing moment by moment during the day my struggle with this. If there was ever a control freak in the universe, it is right here. He is right here, right? I have to come before God every day, and he forgives, and he strengthens, and I hear him saying, Brian, I've got this. And so my prayer right now is, Lord, would you bring a gentleness to my spirit, not as some kind of magic um, thing that you do, but because I know you're sovereign and holy and mighty and you've got things in your hand. Secondly, they were experiencing dryness. Now, these Israelites were literally experiencing a drought that God brought into their lives so that they would get their you know, eyes in the right space, in the right place. But how often have you struggled here? God, I'm dry. I, I don't feel you near. I feel dry. I feel hardened. I can't hear your voice. And I wonder if God ever thinks I'm right here. I've always been right next to you. Jesus said, and surely I'll be with you always, even to the very end of the age. And, and you're just so busy with building up your own kingdom. And there's different reasons why we do that. Maybe it's pride or maybe it's fear. I've got to get all these things in line, God. And he says, you're so busy with your kingdom and your endeavors and your worries and your own agenda that you can't hear me. I, I wonder why the Israelites were so busy building their fine homes. Was it because of pride or was it because of fear? We've got to get these things built up around us. And God says, I'm right here. I want to be center. The reality for us, church, is the nail-scarred hand is there for you to take hold of today and forever. Jesus, yes, was part of the past, and Jesus will be part of the future. But he's part of the present right now, and he wants to be center in your life. Let me ask this. Why did God, we'll go to the third thing here. Why did God need a temple? Because he wanted to be the center of the people's life. It wasn't like, people, I need a house to live in. It's freezing out here. I'm homeless. Would you please build a place for me so that I have somewhere to live? That wasn't why God wanted a temple. It was because he wanted to be at the center. Why did he need a tabernacle in the wilderness? Because he wanted the people to put him at the center of their lives, a God who is full of abundance and provision, who cared for them and loved them. Isaiah 66, 1 and 2, this is what the Lord says, heaven is my home, the earth is my footstool. You can't build a place to contain me. Paul said in Acts 17, 24, the God who made the world and everything in it, the Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples built by human hands. God didn't need a house. He wanted to be at the center of his people's lives. And church, he still desires to be at the center of your life. In fact, you're referred to in the scriptures as temples if you have confessed your faith in Jesus Christ. In 1 Corinthians 6, 19, it says, Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit, that God is with you and in you, that you're not your own? What did Paul say in Philippians 4, 4? Rejoice, the Lord is near, so near that he lives inside of us in his spirit. If you're feeling distant, if you're feeling dry, my question would be, are you lingering in your Abba's presence? Abba, Father, Dad, our Creator and Father. Are you fixing your eyes on Jesus? Are you placing God at the center of the throne of your life? And is it any wonder that we feel distant 
when we don't engage God in his holy word? Is it any wonder we feel distant when we don't involve Jesus, when we don't involve the Holy Spirit in the moment-by-moment daily ventures of our lives? When we fail to have an awareness that Jesus is alive and present, we're going to be dry. Something to contemplate. Are we so enamored with our own kingdoms and our own worries that his voice is drowned out and distant? Secondly, be mindful of misunderstood expectations. Chapter 2 of Haggai, beginning with verse 3. Does anyone remember this house, this temple, in its former splendor? He's talking to these people who came back who, who knew what Jerusalem used to look like. How, how does it look in comparison now? It must like, seem like nothing at all. And it's not like God is provoking them here. I think that he's meeting them saying, I get it. Things don't look the same as, as we thought they would. It must seem like nothing at all. But the Lord says, be strong, Zerubbabel. Be strong, Jeshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Be strong, people still left in the land. And now get to work, for I am, listen to this, for I am with you says the Lord of heaven's armies. My spirit remains among you just as I promised you when you came out of Egypt, so don't be afraid. I have not changed. I haven't gone anywhere. You're just not putting your eyes on me. For this is what the Lord of heaven's army says. In just a little while, I'll again shake the heavens and the earth and the oceans and the dry land. I'll shake all the nations and the treasures of all nations will be brought to this temple. I'll fill this place with glory, says the Lord of heaven's armies. The silver is mine, the gold is mine, says the Lord of heaven's armies. The future glory of this temple will be greater than its past glory. And I'll bring, and, and, and in this place I will bring peace. And, and every time, says the Lord of heaven's armies, says the Lord of heaven's armies, I have these things in my hands. And church, what God is doing now is compared to then through the finished work of the cross and the resurrection of Jesus in his church, is so powerful. We may look at our lives and think, God, I've given you everything that I've got, or God, I confess I've been apathetic. We can look at our lives and say, ask, you know, we've asked for healing and it hasn't come. The suffering I'm experiencing is overwhelming. Nothing in my life is what I expected it to be. How could you ever redeem this brokenness, God? This is not what I thought would be for my family. This is not what I thought my career would be. This is not what I thought. I never thought, God, that I would have to suffer with a disease or that I would have to see my spouse leave before me and be alone. And church, may I remind you of the words of our God, that things may look grim now. In this world, you will have trouble, but Jesus Christ has overcome. Amen? Amen. There is a future and a hope and a new heavenly Jerusalem, and I will tell you, the last two weeks, I'm looking forward to this fragile, weak, human body to be gone and to get my brand new one at the resurrection. Brokenness is real, and some things this side of heaven will be scarred and cracked, and even after, God is restoring it. But this is not the end of the story. Things will not be perfect. We will suffer. We will go through difficult seasons. We will fail. We will drift. But that is not the end of the story. And Haggai reminded the people, this is hard. I know things that you're rebuilding don't look like they used to. I know, you know, expectations of smooth sailing and everything being just the same as they were before you were carried off into exile need to be tempered. This city will not look like it once did. The temple will not look like it once did. And this side of heaven, the garden, will not look like Eden again. Our creation in this place is broken. But church, it will one day. Jesus is going to finish what he started in us and everywhere. The cross of Christ tells me that our Abba, our Heavenly Father, loves us very much. That we have value as his children. Because the fact that Jesus left the message to you and me about this hope, left the message to his children, his church tells me that he has an incredibly high view of people. God believes, and, and, and listen, I think that God believes that his sons and daughters are capable of amazing things. We have been told we need to believe in Jesus, 
And that is good, and that is true, and that is right. But we also need to understand that Jesus believes in us. He thinks we can imitate him, not be perfect, but he thinks we can be like him and that we produce fruit. We've been told we need to have faith in God. And again, that is good and that is true and that is right. But we also need to learn that he has faith in us. And let me just, before you think I'm getting into some humanistic thing, just hold tight, those of you who are panicking right now. Our rabbi Jesus, according to the apostle Paul, thinks we can be like him, not perfect, but a people who produce the fruit of the spirit as he sits at the center priority of our lives. It won't look perfect. I don't need to tell you that. You already know that. It will be messy. We will fail. But I believe this to be true. I think of uh, some teaching that I heard. I think of Peter who stepped out of the boat, right? He stepped out and he began to walk on the water in faith, but he quickly began to sink. And we read that account and we look down and we nod and we say, yeah, that's me too. I'll never be what God wants me to be. Why can't I, my faith be greater? Why do I still wrestle? Why do I still have anxieties? Why do I still make mistakes? Why do I still do these things? I guess I should just stay in the boat next time too. Peter failed, I fail. And we think of Jesus' words, oh, you have little faith as that scolding that we all deserve, that tongue lashing from God that we all deserve. But was it? Peter followed his rabbi out onto the water. As Marty Solomon puts it, he says, I don't believe it was a scolding as much as it was Jesus grabbing Peter by the chin and locking eyes with him and Jesus saying to his student, his disciple, have faith, you can do this because I am with you. I have chosen you. I have called you by name. And some of you need to hear that this morning. You need to fix your eyes on him, church, your Abba, your Father. I, and, and you need to hear him say, I believe in you. I made you for a purpose. I didn't die on the cross for worthless trash. You are my sons and you are my daughters in Christ. I know it's hard here. I know every expectation that you've had may not be coming to fruition, but I have overcome. Fix your eyes on me. Listen to the voice of my spirit and put me at the center of your lives. I can't help but hear Jesus' words in Matthew eleven twenty eight: 28. Come to me, all of you who are weary and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you'll find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Lesson number three, linger in his presence and live faithfully. Marty Solomon goes on to say, in this idea of believing in yourself and having faith in yourself. He says, I'm not talking about a narcissistic faith that seems to elevate my standing in God's created order and lacks humility. I'm not trying to promote some humanistic worldview that seems to assert that the answer to all of our ills somehow lies within us. He says, I truly and earnestly believe that the hope for all this world's brokenness lies in the power of the resurrected Christ and the reality of Jesus. He says, but what I'm talking about talking about faith in myself that recognizes that I am made in the image of my God and creator. The kind of faith that might actually be willing to believe that there was something worth loving and worth saving if God was willing to save it through the story of the cross of Christ. He says, I wonder as I watched my children how it was that my innocence was somehow connected with my confidence. Jesus tells us that if we were just to watch little children for a little while, it would probably do us some good. That if I cannot change and become like a little child, then the kingdom of God will be out of my reach because, well, we'll get there. Children have incredible faith in themselves. Dad and mom are there. They know they're loved. They know they're safe. And they just want to play and they want to be. Later in life, we begin to question all of that. Expectations of perfection and control and performance block out our king. Is he really there for me? Am I really worth loving? And, and can I really do this? And he says, we step out of the boat and we begin to walk and we stumble. We know the wind and the waves are out there ready to sabotage our efforts. We're not surprised when we sink. We knew it would happen. So we grab our life preservers, we get in the boat, and we take the scolding that we knew we'd get from God. In church, we can't hear his voice saying, I love you. I believe in you. I have a purpose for you. Get up. 
walk faithfully. I didn't, never thought you'd walk perfectly. Jesus tells Peter, you and these disciples, I'm going to build, the, you, you are the foundation of the gospel going out to the world. You think about Peter, he knew Peter was going to deny him. And so we're in the boat and we're clutching those life preservers and, and we can't hear the voice of God because we get into self-preservation mode. We build up walls, we buy insurance, we want protection, no offense to anyone who sells insurance. We want protection, we, want to, we do all we can to succeed and manipulate and control and we build up our kingdoms, our kingdoms, our luxurious homes and it's all a lie because whatever we build, whatever we accumulate, whatever strongholds we erect, whatever vices we run to for comfort, they will not satisfy and we know it because he's called us to more. He's saying, step out of the boat, live faithfully, not perfectly. And the only way we will know that we are the beloved sons and daughters of our God is to linger in his presence and to live faithfully, to be reminded of his mercy and love. Church, whatever you're building, if it's not about God's kingdom, I just have news for you. It, fall, it will falter, it will fail. It's all about his kingdom and his gospel. The shoes in, in, in the armor of God, why do you put shoes on? To go somewhere, unless you're one of those people that walks around in bare feet all the time. You're weird, all right? <laughs> Just kidding, you're not. You put shoes on, that's what makes me go, right? The gospel, the, the shoes are the boots of the gospel of peace. It's all about his gospel. In chapter two, Haggai begins a discussion about living faithfully, and he, he's talking to the, about the Levitical law and and talking to the priest, you know, if something defiled touches something clean, that thing come, becomes defiled. And he says in Haggai chapter 2, beginning with verse 14, this is how it is with the people of this nation, says the Lord. And, and I'll explain in a second here. He says, everything they do and everything they offer is defiled by their sin. Look what's happening to you before you begin to lay the foundation of the Lord's temple. When you hope for a 20 bushel crop, you harvested only 10. When you expected to draw 50 gallons from the wine press, you found only 20. I, I sent blight and mildew and hail to destroy everything you worked so hard to produce. Even so, you refu refuse to return to me, says the Lord. And then he says, think about the 18th day of December. And I always remember this chapter because that's my anniversary, that's Lisa and I's anniversary, December 18th. Think about this 18th day of, of December, the day when the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid. Think carefully. I am giving you a promise now while the seed is still in the barn. You have not harvested your grain or your grapevines, fig trees, pomegranates, olive trees, and not yet produced their crops, but from this day forward, I will bless you. When we say that we follow Jesus, but we spend all of our time serving me, we defile the sacrifice of our lives. God wants to be our first love, and here's the beauty about that, is it shows me a God who is full of mercy, giving something that is undeserved. And boy, does that sound like my Savior, Jesus. May he be our first love, our first priority, church, to live faithfully, faithfully with our eyes fixed on him. And did you hear it? From this day onward, I will bless you, I promise. I hear, again, Jesus' words and Haggai's words. And surely I will be with you always, right? You've stumbled, you've sinned, but remember, I am a God of mercy and grace and forgiveness and reconciliation and restoration but we can't experience that when we're running after our own kingdoms. We need to put, we need to put God at the center. Lesson number four, focus daily on that future hope then. That present and future hope. There's something better coming. Verse 21, tells Zerubbabel, the governor of Judah, that I am about to shake the heavens and the earth. I will overthrow royal thrones and destroy power of foreign kingdoms. I'll overthrow their chariots and riders. The horses will fall. Their riders will kill each other. But when this happens, says the Lord of heaven's army, I will honor you, Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, my servant. I'll make you like a signet ring on my finger, says the Lord, for I have chosen you. I am the Lord of heaven's armies. I have spoken. And God gives us promise after promise after promise of victory in his scriptures. God has said it. He has promised. Therefore, it is. Church, when we look at our lives, in this place of, uh, in time and history, the reality is we win. There is more than the time that we spend here in brokenness 
and these fragile bodies. Jesus is the first fruit of multitudes who will experience resurrection and new heavenly bodies. So, lesson five, may we fix our eyes on him. <clears throat> Church, peace and hope and contentedness and gentleness. As Paul discussed in Philippians 4, is about making Jesus the center of our lives. It's about lingering in his presence. It's about saying yes to him daily, moment by moment. And church, here's the truth. God is near. He is with us. He has called you by name. He's, he's, you've won. Make him the center. Again, before Paul ever gets to those famous words in Philippians 4, don't be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and petition, present your request to God, and the peace that transcends all understanding will guard your heart and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Before he ever gets to that, the main point of the entire letter of Philippians is to live as Christ and to die as gain. The main point is put all of your eggs in his basket. Make him your center. The peace that passes understanding, the giving of our anxieties to him, it's not a coping mechanism. It's not praying, God, magically make everything go away. It comes out of a life lived with our eyes fixed on our present, risen Savior, Jesus, who walks with us every day, every moment, and loves us. Amen. I want you to listen to a few verses here. Haggai chapter 113. What does it say? Then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, gave the people this message. I am with you, says the Lord. Haggai chapter 2, the end of verse 4 and 5. Be strong, all you people left in this land. Get to work. What did he say? I am with you, says the Lord of heaven's armies. My spirit remains among you. And just as I promised when you came out of Egypt, so don't be afraid. Where does Paul start? God is with you, so don't be anxious. Philippians 4, 5, let everyone see that everything you, you're considerate in all you do, there's a gentleness, a calm about you because what? The Lord is near. Fix your heart on him, church. Get alone with him. Linger in his presence. Brennan Manning writes this. He said, it's here, lingering in Jesus' presence. When we get alone with him, it's there that we listen with great attentiveness to the voice that calls us beloved. God speaks into the deepest strata of our souls, into our self-hatred and shame and our narcissism and self-occupation, and takes, and takes us through the night into the daylight of his truth, where Jesus inspired these words. Again, God inspired these words, do not be afraid, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. You are precious in my eyes because you are honored and I love you. The mountains may depart, the hills may be shaken, but my love for you will never leave you and my covenant of peace with you will never be shaken. It is God who has called us by name, the God besides whose beauty the Grand Canyon is only a shadow. So I'll ask again this morning, as we draw near to the table, as Haggai asked the people, what does your life center around? Today is a Sunday that over the past several years, um, we've called Say Yes Sunday. And for the most part, it's always been a Sunday about saying yes to service within the body, which is very good. Um, we need people to, to serve and to sacrifice, but I want you to consider it to be more today than that. Um, I, I, I shared this in my blog, and as we come to the table, I, I just, I, I always feel it's important to be, um, to, to be real with boundaries from the pulpit. A week and a half ago, I hit a wall. I think it, it really is the only way to describe it. Um, at times in my life, even in ministry, you know, we can lose sight of the things that matter, and better stated, the one who matters. And mostly in my life, it's just been losing sight of keeping God at the center. With so many tasks and shepherding obligations and family duties and leadership duties and events and needs and my unwillingness to ask for help and just my unwillingness to listen to the lessons that God has taught me in the past, I can get into places where my pace says, Holy Spirit, I need you to get out of the way. I've got things to do. And you would think after so many years, 24 years in ministry, that I would learn, but like Israel, I'm stubborn and I'm human. And so two, two weeks ago, in my father's mercy, he allowed me to hit a wall like I have not hit in a very long time. And once again, I am reminded just how fragile and weak my human body is that I dwell in. And in his grace, he reminded me how strong and loving he is. 
and in his discipline of his kids, because I look at it as a time of pruning right now, currently. He doesn't leave us hanging. When God disciplines us, he walks right beside us because as our teacher and Lord and leader, he wants us to grow. The weeks leading up to Easter and family vacation were filled every minute, it seems, with events and meetings and appointments. And in the, in the backdrop, a horrible respiratory virus that plagued many of you. Many of us shared that together. It was a great thing we shared with one another here. Um, it was awful. Family busyness, my stepmother in the hospital, driving back and forth to South Bend. Um, I entered vacation quite literally weary, absolutely ridden with anxiety, um, which has been a thing that I've dealt with in my life, and I've sat with many of you in when you've experienced it. Um, down, exhausted, and a week later I'm beginning to get my bearings, but has been my many self-inflicted inflicted seasons of this. I know it's going to take time. And in my anxiousness, I turned to Philippians 4, and I spent pretty much the entire week in Florida in Philippians chapter 4, and I always want to jump ahead to, don't be anxious about anything. Lord, help me. Get, get, get rid of all this for me. But again, it begins, always be full of joy in the Lord. I'll say it again, rejoice. Let there be a calm about you. The Lord is near. And then I'm saying, God, what does that mean? <laughs> How do I always rejoice? And what he's teaching me is we can, we can do that when we trust him when we give him control, when we abide in him, when we linger in him, when we put him at the center. And then it goes on to say, right? Let your gentleness be evident to all the Lord is near. When I'm trying to manipulate, when I'm trying to control the world that I live in, when I'm bulldozing through, gentle is not what I am. <laughs> I am a fragile mess. I'm anxious. I'm irritable. I'm rude. And Paul is saying, before anything about anxiety, understand your God has things in his hand. And God's teaching me that again. So for me this morning, I need to say yes to putting him first. I need to say yes to trusting in his provision. I need to say yes to remembering he has everything in his hands. I need to say yes to remembering that he loves me, that he calls me his child, that he invites me to walk with him. And my question is, what's your say yes? For some of you, it's a decision to confess your faith in Jesus as risen Savior, surrender lordship of your life to him, and be immersed into baptism. It's saying, I've been bumping into walls my whole life, trying to do it my way, and God, I surrender my life to you. For some, it's a decision to be baptized. You've been walking with Jesus for many years and have never made that decision. For some, it's getting connected in relationships within the body of Christ. For some, it is finding a place to serve sacrificially. We need you. For some, it's a renewal of time spent in his presence. For others, it's relinquishing whatever struggle that you're carrying right now, that you're trying to control and manipulate, and to put it into the hands of Jesus. For all of us, may we say yes to putting God at the center of our lives. In your bulletin today, there's an insert. looks like this. Say yes insert. We ask you prayerfully read over it. That you would fill it out. That you would drop it in the bucket at the Say Yes Center in the foyer. And further, if you just want to sit and talk and meet, every week you have a We Care card in your bulletin. Mark the back that, hey, I'd like to meet with you, Brian. I would love to sit with you and to talk with you and to pray together. As we come to the table today, may we be reminded of the present risenness of Jesus in our lives. Yes, he rose in past history, and yes, he, our Savior, will rise. We will rise with him again in the future when he comes again, but he is present right now, church, and that is what this table is about. The nail-scarred hand reaches out to you and says, put your hand in mine. Take the sacred hand of your Savior. Confess to me your struggle. Hear me say, I love you and you're forgiven. We give him praise here, church, and we give him thanks. We come to this table as a family. All of our struggles, a lot the same, united in the belief and hope we have in Jesus Christ. In a moment, I'll come up and lead us through the emblems.
in church. Jesus rose. He's alive. He's coming again, but he is present with us and in us in his spirit. And on the night Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples and he said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And he took the cup. He said, this is my blood, the blood of the covenant shed for the forgiveness of many sins. Do this in remembrance of me. As we come to our closing invitation hymn, we're going to be singing, Come Thou Fount. I want us to focus on the goodness and the mercy of Jesus Christ. I think of the words of this old song about how we're prone to wander, but God in his grace continues to pursue us. This morning, if you're here and you've been struggling, I want to remind you that the present Jesus is with you right now. In Christ, um, Christian brothers and sisters that are here, sons and daughters of the King, remember that he loves you and he's with you. This morning, if you've never made a decision to say yes to Jesus, and you've been thinking about it, like I said, fill out one of those cards, talk to me, set up a meeting. Let's talk right now, come up, I'll talk to you after service is done. But today is the day to confess your faith in Jesus, to leave your life of sin, and to be buried in the waters of baptism, risen to new life, walking with Jesus. Let's stand.
love to hear about the ladies of spring salad coming up on Saturday, May 4th. Bring a salad, fruit, and desserts, and join us for this fun and encouraging evening. Following supper, we will worship together, and Lindsay Steerbeck, no, Steerbeck, 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 she will be sharing a message of faith, love, and community. Sign up at the Say Yes Center if you'd like to decorate the table, and guys, sign up to help serve and clean up. As we think about today's message, I want to close with Matthew chapter 6, verse 32, when it says, Seek the kingdom of God above all else, and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this beautiful day and the, the, the signs of spring coming upon us and, and as you rejuvenate us, and uh, we just need a little bit of energy to uh, come out of the season. Lord, I ask now that uh, as we go forward, that especially in times like these, with, with strife overseas,